Hey everyone, this is Too Elusive back with another installment of the Mega Man Battle Network series and we're now going to look at its second entry. Battle Network 2 is another example of what happens when a sequel is made properly even with a few bumps on the road here and there, and you're going to see all of that when we dive deeper into the video. To start things off, Battle Network 2 has a darker tone to it with its storytelling this time around, which is a bit of a shock considering the fact that this series is mostly lighthearted. The story opens up with some shady characters conversing among themselves before we're reintroduced to Lan and his hatred for schoolwork. A scolding from his mom in the obligatory tutorial later, Lan and his friends learn that they could become city net battlers, which is basically the lesser version of the official net battlers that Chaud is a part of. This is done by clearing exams not only to obtain that license, but to also increase their rank, which gives that city net battler access to other areas in the network. Things seem to be at peace for the moment, but this is a Mega Man game where peace likes to take a vacation. Gas powered heaters are malfunctioning, someone wants to blow up the water dam and create a massive flood, and the king of Yumland was outright deleted. With the defeat of World 3, the net mafia known as Gospel began to make their moves, spreading net crime all over the world. And if you have a decent amount of knowledge on the Mega Man franchise as a whole, the name Gospel may have a bigger meaning than you may think. Despite World 3's more organized methods of carrying out their attacks and having a goal behind each one, Gospel's attacks are more scattered brain but arguably far more detrimental than the crimes committed by World 3, seeing as how most of their attacks affect a massive part of the population than just a few individuals here and there. Yes, the net crime involving Yai was more of an isolated incident, all things considered, but after that, everything else was on a catastrophic level. The mother system, which is basically a supercomputer that controls all of Scilab, was hijacked, Young Land was under siege, a passenger plane was set for a collision course, and even the official net battlers were duped to the point where they almost bit the dust here. Even Land and Chalt were caught up in that manipulation to fight each other to the point of deletion. Yes, your first battle against your rival results in deleting his net navy outright. Gospel was not pulling any of their punches here. After the Hikari brothers put a stop to Gospel's crimes and narrowed down their headquarters, they came face to face with a child who appears to be no older than Lan. This child goes by the name of Sean Oboro, who wants nothing more than to take down the world that treated him poorly while he was growing up, and he was going to do that by unleashing a super navy. This navy turned out to be the almighty base, the same secret boss you would have fought in the previous game if you hadn't met all the conditions. And hey, he even makes a callback to his name in Japan. How? However, he is far weaker here compared to his former self, and that is because this version of him is a fake. It turns out that Sean's super navy is made up of viruses and will bring an absolute end to net society if this virus manages to set foot into the main network. Once Lan and Mega Man sync up and took down this super virus, which is later on known as Gospel, the world is saved once again. However, before the credits roll, we learn that someone was working behind the scenes the entire time and using Sean to set the groundwork for an even bigger scheme in the future. Meanwhile, the game ends on a cliffhanger as the real base is hunting down the remaining clones of himself and plotting his revenge on the humans who made these inferior copies, setting up the events that will take place in the next installment, which I cannot wait wait to talk about. But now that we've tackled the story, let me start by saying that Battle Network 2 is the entry that defined the rest of the series. Yes, each entry in Battle Network brings something new to the table that will be added into the game's core mechanics, but most of the features you see in the later games came straight from the one we're going to be talking about today. Let's start with the changes made to the battle system. Battles for the most part are exactly the same as the first, with the player being able to select battle chips in order to dish out the pain on the viruses they encounter, all while dodging and repositioning themselves on a 3x3 grid system. Except now when you're selecting your battle chips, all of the chips you cannot select with your current one will be dimmed, and their codes will be displayed right under the chips icon, streamlining the entire chip selecting process. Speaking of codes, Battle Network 2 introduces the asterisk code which will instantly become your new best friend. Any chip with the asterisk code is basically treated as a freebie, meaning you can select that chip with the others regardless of what their codes are. They can even be used in setting up program advances so as long as you select the proper order for them to be executed. Program advances themselves are also easier to pull off and that was made possible thanks to the new and improved add system. This time, in order to add more slots, you need to select the chips that you don't mind sacrificing 
slicing first, then hit the add button like before. The next time you bring up your chip selection, you'll have additional slots corresponding to the number of chips that was sacrificed. Best part is, these slots don't go away either, they're here to stay. This new add system makes it much easier to cycle through any unwanted chips and increase the odds of getting the ones you want, again, making program advances far more viable from here on. There are also some other notable changes I can point out too, like certain chips no longer dimming the screen, or the fact that any damage Mega Man receives in battle will not be restored to full health once the fight is over, keeping the player on their toes at all times. But the biggest change that I absolutely welcome with open arms is this one. Yes, you can finally run from fights. Anytime you have your chip select window open, hitting that L trigger will bring up the option to run away. Do keep in mind though that if the viruses are strong enough, you won't be able to escape. A good way to determine if you'll succeed or fail is to look at the HP differences between Mega Man and the virus's combined health pool. If your health is reasonably higher, the odds are greatly in your favor. Of course, if you really want to guarantee that you'll succeed, you can always keep an escape battle chip in your folder, just in case. There is one last thing I need to talk about in regards to the battle system, and that is with Mega Man himself. Once you've acquired the Change.Bat program somewhere in the midpoint of the game, Mega Man will transform after 280 battles have been fought. As soon as you see the results screen slide away instead of fading into black, followed by this melody, you'll know it's time. This is known as a style change, and not to be confused with the style change system in Devil May Cry, Mega Man can acquire a new style based on how the player operates him. There are five styles in total, each one giving Mega Man different effects based on which one he has. Guts is an offensive heavy style with a strong focus on using your buster. It doubles Mega Man's attack power while reducing his rapid stat to nothing, meaning you'll be trading your speed for more power. So for example, if you have five power-ups allocated to your buster, you'll deal 10 damage per shot which I've abused through most of my playthrough. Along with that, you'll also gain super armor, so Mega Man will no longer flinch when he's hit. This means you can land your charge shots and chips without the fear of being interrupted. Getting this style requires you to use your buster as often as possible, especially when your custom gauge is full. Up next is the Royal Guy, I mean Shield style, which as the name implies is more focused on defense. At the start of every fight, Mega Man will come equipped with a free barrier. He will also be able to deploy a shield anytime the player hits the backwards and B button roughly at the same time to block off any attacks. So if you prefer to have more survivability, Shield style will be the way to go. To acquire the shield, you need to win as many fights as possible without getting touched while also spamming as many recovery and shield type battleships as possible. Then we have Custom Style, which is more focused on battle chip usage and centered around those who want to abuse program advances. This style lets the player start their battles with 7 chip slots instead of the usual 5. While on the surface that may not sound like much, having 2 additional chip slots along with the 5 you normally have can make a big difference when fishing for certain chips. To get this one, the player has to select as many non-dimming chips as possible in one turn. And just for clarity, the non-dimming chips are basically those battle chips that cause the screen to dim down and freeze time while the chip action is taking place. You also want to use the add function or make use of the program advances as often as possible. I find it a lot easier to get this style by just adding chips in every single fight and not use my buster at all. And here we have team style. This one's all about using navi chips above anything else. You can think of them as a summoner job from Final Fantasy. As team style, you can store up to 8 navi chips in your folder instead of the usual 4. So if you love using navi chips more than anything, this is the style you want. With that description alone, I don't think I need to tell you how to get team style, but in case you were wondering, just spam those navi chips like no tomorrow. Along with the 4 styles I mentioned earlier, yes, I am aware that I said 5, and there is 5. 
but we will get to that last one in a moment. Each style comes equipped with an element, and unlike the styles themselves, you cannot manipulate which element you'll get. So you're just gonna have to hope that the RNG is kind enough to give you the element you want. All of the elements really do is change the property of Mega Man's charge shot, each one having fixed damage. Fire shoots a flamethrower three squares ahead, which hits for a whopping 50. Aqua hits for 30 and damages anyone who is behind the target, plus it has unlimited range and a shorter charge. Electric shoots a zap rain that only does 20 damage, but it paralyzes enemies which is perfect for chip setups and combos. Finally, Wood creates a tornado that can only reach two squares ahead and deal 20 damage, but that sucker can hit up to eight times making it the highest damaging charge shot in Mega Man's arsenal. Of course with each of these elements, Mega Man will also gain their respective weaknesses, but his charge shot will also deal double damage to any enemy that is weak to them. Each style is also capable of leveling up, which is done by battling with the same style change equipped and fighting exactly as you would while acquiring them. Each time you level up, your charge shot's damage output will increase and you can level up every style at least three times. You can also acquire up to two different style changes, which can be switched in Mega Man's status menu. And now, the last thing I need to talk about in regards of Mega Man style change is hub style. Hub style is what happens when Land and Mega Man become perfectly synchronized, resulting in Mega Man gaining an immense level of power. He acquires all of the abilities that the other four styles would have given him, except for a few changes. Guts will still double in attack power, but since he does not use an elemental attack like the others, his default charge shot will deal 50 damage if his attack power is maxed out. This is why his neutral form had its charge shot toned down from the previous entry. As for his chip selection, he does not get 7 chips to select from, he starts with a whopping 10. This easily makes it the best style in the entire game, but it comes with a huge price. Anytime you're using this style, Mega Man's HP is cut in half, and if you know the story elements centered around Land and Mega Man, it makes perfect sense why that is the case. Either way, with all of this additional power, you'll need to still be careful with that massive HP drop. This is also the only style in the game that does not get any upgrades, plus getting this style is not an easy task at all. You need to S rank every version 3 net navi in the game at least once, with the exception of base. Keep in mind, however, that version 3 net navis are usually packed with a lot more health, much faster, and far more aggressive than the original versions, so you're going to need to bring your A game into these brutal fights if you want to get this style. And if you do manage to get it, make sure you don't delete it by accident, because once you do, you'll never be able to get it back as this is the only way you can acquire this style in the first place. Your chip folder also receives some balance tweaking here and there, plus a regular memory system has been added. Mega Man can collect these new upgrades called regups, which will increase Mega Man's regular memory. The purpose of this is to allow the player to assign a chip in their folder to always appear on the first slot when they bring up their chip select screen, and this feature has appeared in every Battle Network game since then. Now take a look at this environment. This is not a themed dungeon or someone's homepage. What you are seeing are different areas of the network that are all inter connected. The network has received a complete overhaul from the first game on both a visual and mechanical standpoint, as the network in the first game was extremely bare bones. With each section in the network having its own visual themes, it gives the game a much better sense of exploration and personality, making it exciting to see what the next area is going to bring to the table. Plus, when you hit the pause menu, the game will also tell you where you are in the network, a feature that did not exist in the first game either. This is especially helpful when you consider the fact that Battle Network 2 also introduces a mission board, which is basically where the player can go to complete optional side quests. Yes, some of these are required to do, but I feel like they were placed there to introduce the player to what kind of missions they could be getting themselves into, so I don't see too much harm in that. Also, if you happen to be a Trails of player, you're definitely going to feel right at home here. I will say that I highly recommend players to do them, as they can yield some pretty awesome rewards for their efforts, and it's also required if you plan to do the post-game content. Other quality of life changes I could mention is how the devs gave more attention to little things that actually matter, like giving all the different locations unique music pieces rather than listening to the same ACDC theme in different areas or everything sounding like you're standing in Land's room when you are clearly somewhere else. This was something I meant to bring up when talking about the first game, but I decided to hold off until now just because I find the addition of these music pieces to be an absolute necessity, as it gives the game and its environments more character.
While I am on the subject of music, this game easily has one of the best boss themes throughout the entire series. That funky tune you hear in the beginning always puts me in a fighting mood as I can never get tired of it. Plus, when you consider the nature of this game's storytelling, the melody fits the tone of this game very well. But one area of the game that did not get as much quality as the others, which is both a good and a bad thing depending on how you look at it, is a translation when it came to localizing the game here in the West. Since a game like this is aimed towards a younger audience, it's expected for the localization team to make some changes here and there in the game's original script so it can fit that type of narrative. As a result, most of the darker elements that would have been seen in said dialogue would have been removed. I mean, just look at 4Kid's attempt at trying to tone down One Piece for a younger audience. But here in Battle Network 2, toning down the original script was tossed aside as it was practically untouched, leading to some pretty funny scenarios like the dialogue exchange between Lan and the rap artist on the plane, or some rather interesting situations like the case of Miss Millions. Jeez lady, calm down, he's just a fifth grader. Fifth grader who can also swear up a storm if he wants to. But honestly, I'm glad the translation, or lack thereof, is at its purity here. I'm pretty sure that the darker scenes in this game would have had a lesser impact if they were toned down in any way. Like how Arashi is taken out right at the very beginning of the game when he failed his mission, or how the official net battlers nearly died during the Princess Pride scenario. I just get the feeling that these would have been toned down had the translation received any correction, and I wouldn't be surprised if the dialogue does get cleaned up once the Legacy Collection drops in April. I could say that I hope that that doesn't happen, Happen, but seeing as how they went and changed the Maverick's name to their intended ones in X5, it would be best not to hold any expectations, or rather, don't hold any at all. As far as the game's difficulty goes, I want to say that Battle Network 2 is arguably the hardest game of them all, at least during your first playthrough of the game, both for good and bad reasons alike. The good reasons coming mostly from the fact that the dungeons in the second game are more balanced and well throughout, save for a few issues like the fact that you still have to deal with random encounters while solving dungeon puzzles. It's the main reason why I didn't enjoy Shadow Man's dungeon since every time I'm in the middle of solving a word puzzle they have here, they keep throwing battle after battle after battle which unfortunately I was not strong enough to be able to run away from these fights at the time either. Also, it is said that the encounter rate was lowered in this game but I don't believe leave that for a bit as I've ran into fights very often in this game. On the bright side, the amount of damage Mega Man takes has also been toned down because the blue bomber cannot recover health once the fight has concluded, so Mega Man is no longer made of paper mache here. However, a lot of enemies you face, especially the bosses, will be packed with a lot more health compared to the first title, making the fights much longer and creating a lot of heart pounding moments depending on who you're fighting against. Thunder Man, for example, can be a royal pain since he sits in the back row the entire fight while bombarding you with lightning bolts from above, and his clouds are not only so self-automated obstacles, but they can also harm you too if you stand in front of them for too long. Or in the case of Magnet Man, whose panels are magnetized and will force you into a bad position where he can easily hit you with his attacks or set you up to be smashed into pieces with one of the coolest signature moves in the entire game, the North-South Tackle. If you hit him too many, with too many tree bombs first. Ha ha. Ha ha. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> that would, that would happen, wouldn't it? It would. <laughs> it would. <laughs> this leads to a situation where a player has to rely heavily on program advances in order to get the best damage output they can possibly get in order to handle these boss fights or use some kind of cheesy strategy to take them out, which is why I say the game is really difficult only on your first time. Once you've learned all the tricks, combos, and program advances, you can pretty much break Battle Network 2 in half, kind of like what happens when you replay Final Fantasy VIII after realizing all of the broken mechanics you can exploit there. The last thing I need to discuss that this game also gave us are two more things that became a staple throughout the Bow Network series. Those two being an actual final dungeon and a more defined post game that feels more 
post gamey again these are two elements i did not talk about too much in the first game because both of them are very bare bones the first game's final dungeon had you running through many sections of all the previous dungeons you've cleared with no bosses to deal with until you've reached magic man complete with a soundtrack that while it fits the area it doesn't exactly give you a sense of a final charge to a grand battle kind of feeling. Meanwhile, the post game just has you running through the far reaches of the net and fighting super powered bosses. In Battle Network 2, however, you not only have a final dungeon that comes complete with a theme that's more fitting of the description I've mentioned earlier, the game also throws some bosses at you while you're storming the enemy base. As for its post game, well, if you meet the requirements to access it, you'll be treated to a unique hidden dungeon with dangerous enemies, plenty of goods, and powerful bosses alike. A portion of a game that truly tests your mastery as you're only going to be fighting the best in these parts and you'll be locked out of being able to jack out if things get dicey so i hope you're prepared when you get here Battle Network 2 has done a wonderful job at taking a bare bones game and applying a very good amount of improvements that are reused in each game moving forward. The more fluid battle system, a runaway option, the regular memory system, and a more suitable gimmick that genuinely allows Mega Man to feel more mega. So why is it that I don't play this game all that much despite giving it such high praise? It couldn't be because of 3. I mean, granted, 3 is a far superior entry in every way, but you're talking to a guy who still gets a high amount of enjoyment from playing the first Mega Man Legends when Mega Man Legends 2 is a much better game than its first. But then I got to this one particular section in the game that freezes its momentum. A section so bad, it made me put the game down several times before I completed it, which is pretty much the biggest reason why it took me so long to get this video out. Yes, I'm talking about the Freeze Man arc. Let me break down what happens here. At the beginning of the arc, you learn that the entire world is suffering from natural disasters due to Gospel's attacks on the environment system. This is caused by large chunks of ice that appear out of nowhere, blocking all pathways and damaging the infrastructure of the entire network. Your job is to destroy these ice chunks, but only once you've acquired the right program to take out the more potent ones you'll encounter later on as you go along. Also, each time you destroy these ice chunks, you'll be jumped by viruses immediately after. So what is so bad about this whole thing? It is the insane levels of backtracking you'll have to do in this obligatory drawn out fetch quest. In order to get these programs to melt the more powerful ice blocks, you'll often need to run back and forth between the cyber world and the undernet plenty of times and search for certain NPCs who will very often tell you to go back to talk to somebody else and one of these goons will withhold information from you unless you get him a stupid zap ring to be. The network is falling apart at the seams and the entire world is in danger. And all you care about is your stupid battle chip. You are so lucky I am playing as the most pure hearted protagonist right now. Otherwise, I will delete you where you stand. This is easily one of the worst arcs you'll ever have to deal with in the entire series, as it feels like a very padded mess that could have been toned down. And believe it or not, this is still not the absolute worst thing you'll ever have to deal with throughout the entire Battle Network series, but it does come pretty close. Aside from the mistakes that were made, Battle Network 2 is still an overall great sequel that does what you'd expect the sequel to do, which is taking all of the elements that the first game provided and improving upon them for a better experience. If it wasn't for that Freeze Man arc, I'd put this up there as one of the best entries in the series. I can, however, say that it does make for a good entry point for those who are entirely new to Battle Network as a whole. Well, there you have it everyone, another Battle Network down and several more to go. I can't quite tell you when the third installment is going to drop due to how ruthless these game releases have been as of late, as I'd like to go ahead and cover them, especially the late Sonic Frontiers, Spark the Electric Jester 3, and High Five Rush. But rest assured that the third installment of the Battle Network series shall drop once it has finished cooking in the oven. Until then, feel free to hit me with that siggity sub, like the video if you enjoyed it, and plenty of thumbs fall off. Hope to see you in the next one.